like to thank Brother Jack for reading our scriptural text this morning. Our scriptural text was Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, Nehemiah 1, 7 was read, so I believe that I gave Clint the wrong verse. And since he's not here to defend himself, Clint gave you the wrong verse. I <laughs> gave him the right verse. But it's Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. That's our scriptural text. And uh, Brother Ricky uh, read the scriptural text this morning in his song service. And so it's from that passage of scripture, Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, Wisdom Witnessed in Wrath. Wisdom Witnessed in Wrath. We're studying the book of Nahum, but it's very hard for us to even appreciate the book of Nahum until we have taken a look at the book of Jonah. And we see that in the book of Jonah, we see in that book God shows that he loved the pagan Assyrians. We see that God sent a prophet from the northern kingdom to Nineveh to preach to the people there. Jonah didn't want to do it, but God had the final say, and Jonah had no choice but to go to Nineveh and tell them what God wanted spoken. But when we come to the book of Nahum, we see that the book of Nahum shows that God held these Assyrians accountable for their sins, just like God holds everybody accountable for their sins. When we read the book of Nahum, Nahum consists of a prophecy written by the prophet Nahum about 650 BC that Nineveh, which was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, would fall because of God's judgment against its rebellion and against its cruelty. This happened around 612 BC, just as the prophet predicted when the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians and the Medes. Now, Assyria, at the time of this particular prophecy in the book of Nahum, had been the dominant world power for more than a century when Nahum spoke these words. Now, God's judgment does not always come quickly, but when it does come, we need to recognize that it is efficient and his judgment is thorough. Which brings us to the book of Nahum when we look at Nahum chapter 1. In Nahum chapter 1, the prophet speaks about God's wrath against Nineveh. Remember in the book of Jonah, he had an eight-word sermon for the people of Nineveh. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But the people of Nineveh repented and God delayed, relented on what he was going to do to Nineveh. But now we come to 110 years later in which the people had gone back from their repentance and started to engage in more rebellion and cruelty. And so God says, because of that, my wrath is against this city. We learn much about God before and after the reading of Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. Oftentimes when we read Nahum chapter 1 verse 7, we like to just park at that particular verse and lift that text from its context, making it a pretext, not appreciating what God is saying in the midst of this chapter. When we take a look at Nahum chapter 1, verses 2 through 6, we learn some things about God in his wrath. The Bible says in Nahum chapter 1, verse 2, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Eshan and Carmel 
wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. This is the God that is going to express his wrath and ex exercise his judgment against a group of people who have engaged in rebellion and cruelty against him and his people. But then after verse 7, we see that there's verses 8 through 15. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible reads, But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. What do you plot against the Lord? The Lord, He will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. For they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble fully dried. From you came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break his yoke from off you and will burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given commandment about you. No more shall your name be perpetuated. From the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the metal image. I will make your grave, for you are vowed. Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. God gives a promise to Judah in verse 15 that the God that I am, I will take care of your enemies for you. Because not only have they done this against you, they have done this against me, and I will cut them off that you will never hear of them again. And so when we look at the things that are said in Nahum chapter 1, verses 2 through 6, in Nahum chapter 1, verses 8 through 15, we see in Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, that for some reason, Hearing everything that was said before this verse and everything that was said after this verse, we come upon an island, if you will, in Nahum's stormy lake. All is calm in verse 7, though the whole context is tossed with tempest. The text itself, when we look at Nahum chapter 1, is all about God. And when we understand who God is, we recognize that this text brims over with his praise. And so when we take a look at Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, we witness God's wisdom in the midst of his wrath. Now, there's three points I want to bring to your attention this morning, and all the points are going to come from verse 7, and then the lesson is yours to respond to. When we look at Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, the first thing I want us to see is the Christian's comprehension of God. The Christian's comprehension of God. Where do we see the Christian's comprehension of God? In the first phrase in this text, the Bible says the Lord is good. If we get nothing else out of this sermon, then just get that point that the Lord is good. Don't you know that God describes himself as good? Good is how God is described in this text. There is no other adjective given because no other adjective is needed. When we say that the Lord is good, we've said enough. See, Nahum says that God being good means that he is pleasant, he is admirable, he is also worthy. Don't you know that God alone is morally perfect and he is our example of goodness? We please God, my brothers and sisters, when we try to follow his example of goodness. Every day we live, we need to look more and more like Jesus. 
And the way we look more and more like Jesus is by striving to be godly and not ungodly. We get more and more like Jesus by living in godliness and not ungodliness. So when we speak of God being good, this means that God is good in himself, essentially and independently. It means that God is good essentially and independently. Don't you know that eight times in the English Standard Version of the Bible, the phrase, the Lord is good, is given. It's the phrase of choice to describe the God of heaven that does all things well. The psalmist says it four times. The prophet Jeremiah says it twice. The prophet Nahum uses it in our scriptural text. And the apostle Peter speaks the same in 1 Peter chapter 2 and the verses 3. Now when we talk about God being good essentially, God is essentially good because this is just who he is. There is nothing else that needs to be said about God. When we talk about how God is love, no need to define it. When we talk about how God is good, no need to define it. It's just who he is. And so that just simply means that as we go and deal with him independently, that tells us also that God is not good relatively. That means that we don't say that God is good compared to us. God is good even if there is no us because that's who he is. Is. He is absolutely good. If God chooses to bless us, he is good. If God chooses never to do another thing for us, he is still good. And if we have never existed, God is still good. But not only is he good essentially and independently, but he's also good eternally. That means that he does not change. That means that he is good forever. God doesn't have some good days and some bad days. God has nothing but good days because he is good eternally. The goodness of God doesn't run dry. He doesn't run out of goodness. He doesn't look at his creation and say, oh, I would be good to you today, but my goodness well has run dry. No, God essence is good. He is good eternally. The goodness of God never ceases. Listen to your Bible in Psalm 100 and the verses five. Psalm 100 and the verses five, the Bible reads, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Not only is he good eternally and independently and essentially, but God is good divinely. He's good in person. The Godhead itself is good. So when we talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're all good. The Father is good. Psalm 34, verse 8. The Son is good. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. The Holy Spirit is good. Psalm 143, verse 10. So not only is the Lord good divinely and eternally, independently and essentially, but God is good in all his acts of grace. Whenever God gives us that which we do, do not deserve, that's just God being good. Listen to your Bible in Psalm 145, and the verses are 8 and 9. Psalm 145, verse 8 and 9, the Bible reads, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Not only is God good because of his grace, 
Not only is he good eternally and divinely and essentially and independently, but God is good not some of the time, but all the time. God is good in all former acts of providence. That means that everything that God has already done proves that he is good. God is good in his present acts. No matter what those present acts may be, God is good in all that he is doing right here, right now. God is good because he's a good stronghold, which we're going to expound upon in the second point. That means that in times of trouble, we serve a God that can be trusted. So if you're ever in a jam, if things are not going your way, if your haters are knocking on your door, you can take your trouble to God and he will work it out because he is a stronghold for us. He's good at that. And not only that, he is good to his own people who find their goodness in him. See, when the Bible teaches us that the fruit of the spirit is goodness, that means because the spirit dwells in us, we have no choice but to be good. And the goodness that we produce comes from God himself because what? The Lord is good. Listen to your Bible. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. The Bible reads, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we learn in the New Testament that God works things out for our good. And this is something that we ought to know. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the Apostle Paul writes, And we know that for those who, are, who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So I want us to praise God as good in the most emphatic and unlimited sense. Whoever else may or may not be good we know that the Lord is good. And there is only one who is good, Matthew chapter 19, verse 17, and that one is God. As we move on to our second point, not only is the Christian's comprehension of God found in Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, but the Christian's cover in God is also found in Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. When we look at that second phrase where it says a stronghold in the day of trouble. In that verse, in that text, in that phrase, we learn that our hedge of protection, our covering is in God himself. And when does he do it? Whenever we find ourselves surrounded by trouble. God stands between us and the trouble and protects us from the trouble. See, the Bible says that God is a stronghold. That's a word that we don't use much today. But when we look at this word stronghold, it means that he is well fortified. He is a well fortified place. It means that God is our fortress. That means that no matter what is going on in my life, if I'm looking to be saved and safe and protected from the perils of this wicked and perverse generation, I need to find a home in God. Because every place outside of God is not safe. The Bible tells us that God is a stronghold under special circumstances. See, when the Bible talks about God being a stronghold, he is a stronghold whether we have a day of trouble or not. But if we do have a day of trouble, if we do have times of trouble, God doesn't cease being a stronghold. See, sometimes some places are only as strong as the things that are going on around us. You know, some people say, y'all, I got a great house. Yeah, your house is strong until an earthquake comes. Your, your house is strong until a hurricane shows up 
Your house is strong until a tsunami hits. Your house is strong until fire comes upon it. But see, God is a stronghold, fire or no fire. God is a stronghold, tsunami or no tsunami. God is a stronghold, trouble or no trouble. And so when trouble comes upon us, that is a special circumstance. And God is a stronghold in these special circumstances. Notice he says, in the day of trouble. If we emphasize the the, we're talking about when trial is special and vehement. Don't you know it's good to know that we have a stronghold in God? If we emphasize day, this is where we need to shout. Because when he talks about day, that means that it's temporary. That means it's not going to last always. That doesn't mean that it may not last a long time. It just means it's not going to last forever. And if it lasts until the day that we breathe our last, God is still good and he is still a stronghold in that situation. Not only that, we read that if we emphasize trouble, we're talking about when within, without, or around, there seems to be only worry, fear, want, and grief. If we are experiencing these things, no matter where it's coming from, God is still our stronghold. But not only is he as our stronghold under special circumstances, he's always securing our safety. That's what he does as our stronghold. For a stronghold is always strong, even when there is no immediate war. We simply need to walk in his way. Listen to your Bible. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 29. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 29. The proverbial writer writes, The way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless, but destruction to evildoers. So that means that if we are blameless, we're doing what God says, he's our stronghold. But if we are evildoers, that same stronghold that protects the blameless destroys the evildoer. And so that's why we need to walk in the way of the Lord so that the Lord can be our stronghold, so that he can secure our safety. Not only that, he maintains our peace. He maintains our peace. Within the walls of a castle, men walk at ease, for they are shut in from enemies. This is what God does for us when he is our stronghold. Don't you know that it doesn't matter what's going on in the world outside of the stronghold? It doesn't matter what Rap Shaky is saying at the wall of the stronghold. It doesn't matter what your haters are saying about you. It doesn't matter what your enemies threaten to do against you. If God is our stronghold, whatever storms there are, it's good to know that we serve a God that serves as our hedge of protection to give us peace in the midst of our enemies. Listen to what David had to say about the God that he served. And dare I say, we serve the same God in 2 Samuel chapter 22. Verses 2 through 4, 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 2 through 4. The Bible reads, the Lord is my rock. What else, David? He's also my fortress. What else, David? He is my deliverer. What else, David? He is my God. What else, David? Oh, in case you missed what I said the first time, he's also my rock in whom I take refuge. David says, but I'm not done. The same God that is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, and my God, he's also my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, and my refuge. Oh, and by the way, did I mention he's also my savior? What makes him my savior? Because he has saved me from violence. And because he has saved me from violence, because he is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my rock, my God in whom I take refuge, because he's my shield, my horn of salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior, I will call upon the Lord. And I will call upon the Lord because the Lord is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. This is why we can have peace. Amen. But not only that, he defies our foes, which means that if our foes are reasonably smart, they won't attack us. 
because they know they can't get past the stronghold. Listen to your Bible, Psalm 9, verse 9. In Psalm 9, verse 9, David writes, The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. When we look at the context of Psalm 9, we see what David is doing in this text is that he's actually recounting all the wondrous deeds of God. He gives God praise for the victories he's won in conquering neighboring tribes. And we can read about these conquests in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 14, as he is establishing his kingdom under a united Israel. God defied the foes of David, and he is still in the business of defying our foes today. If, if he is our stronghold, we are encouraged to be kind to the oppressed. We are encouraged to be kind to the needy. We are encouraged to be kind to those who are going through times of trouble. Because if we are not kind to the oppressed, if we are not kind to the needy, if we are not kind to those who are in times of trouble, then God has no problem in reminding those of us who afflict the oppressed, the needy, and those in trouble that we're nothing but mere mortals. He will remind us quickly, swiftly, and absolutely that we're just men, that we're just women that we owe our very creation and existence to a God who is bigger than us because God is good. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble. So may we always remain in the fortress of God and never become a foe of God. But not only does God give us peace and defy our foes and always gives us security and he's a stronghold in special circumstances, but he also abides forever the same, always a sure refuge for the needy. God doesn't stop being a stronghold. Whether we're in the fortress or out of the fortress, God is still a stronghold. Listen to your Bible. Isaiah 25, verses 4 and 5. In Isaiah chapter 25, verse 4 and 5, the prophet Isaiah writes, for you have been a stronghold to the poor. You have been a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat, for the breath of the roofless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud, so the song of the roofless is put down. That means that that's just the prophet's way of saying that whatever people say about you, God, if he is your stronghold, knows how to shut their minds. He knows how to silence them. They may be ruthless, but God knows how to put down the song of the ruthless. And so if we know that God is good, and he is a stronghold in the day of trouble, then what we need to do is we need to run to God as the people of the open country in Bible times flew to the wall cities in the time of war. Because I read somewhere that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it. And that righteous man, because he runs to the Lord, whose name is a strong tower, will be saved. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 18. So not only the Christian's cover is in God, not only do we have the Christian's comprehension of God, but as we conclude this lesson, we look at Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, and we learn about the Christian's communion with God in this text. Because he ends Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 by saying, he knows those who take refuge in him. He knows those who take refuge in him. My brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, this is the language of fellowship. We serve a God who is good and is a stronghold in the day of trouble. That means God is good 
despite us. And by faith, God is a stronghold to us. And by his grace, God knows us. That means that he loves and cares for us. And so when we have fellowship with God, then he has an intimate acquaintance with us. That means he knows us personally. We are of his fold. We have a true and not a made up relationship with him. Listen to your Bible in Psalm 31, verse 7 and 8. Psalm 31, verse 7 and 8, the Bible reads, I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. When we have fellowship with God, not only does he have an intimate acquaintance with us, but his tender care will supply all our needs. Listen to your Bible. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, the Bible reads, And God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Is that what your Bible says? Well, you must have a different Bible than me because my Bible says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. If we just simply say, and God, that disconnects us from God and God from us. But when I say my God, that means that I have a connection with him and he has a connection with me. And so if my God will do this for me, then he will do this for all those that have a relationship with him. That's what his tender care does when we have fellowship with him. Why? Because he knows us. That's what makes him my God. And so when we have fellowship with God, he gives his divine, his divine approval of us. Listen to your Bible. When we take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, the Apostle Paul writes to the young preacher Timothy. He said, but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. If we say we know God and God knows us, then that should be our motivation to depart from sin because the God that we know and the God that knows us has nothing to do with sin because he is holy, holy, holy. So if we are not in God, if God doesn't know us, if we have no fellowship with him, then he says, I do not know where you come from. This was the message he says to those outside of his son in Luke chapter 13, verse 25. If we have fellowship with God, then his loving communion with us serves as the best proof that we are known to him and we are his beloved friends. Listen to the language of Jesus in John chapter 15, verse 14. In John chapter 15, verse 14, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Oh, to be a friend of Jesus. We need to be able to sing that song with integrity. What a friend we have in Jesus. But we cannot sing that if we do not have fellowship with his father. Not only that, when we have fellowship with God, then God offers his open acknowledgement. That means that he claims us now and will confess us before the assembled worlds. Listen to your Bible in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Hear what Jesus had to say. Jesus says, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Jesus says, instead, I will confess his name before my father, who is good, and before his angels. In other words, you were not ashamed of me. I will not be ashamed of you. You represented me down here. I will represent you up there. You didn't deny me down here. Therefore, I will not deny you up there. Why? Because the Lord is good. So let us believe in the good of the Lord, even when we cannot discern it with our naked eye. Let us fly to his protection 
when storms of trouble fall. Let us confide in his loving care when hunted by our enemies. Let us take care that we rely upon him in Christ Jesus for salvation. Oh, praise his name. So where do you stand this morning? You've heard that the Lord is good. But the question is, have you tasted and have seen for yourself that the Lord is good? If not, this is your opportunity to not just try the Lord, but to commit yourself fully and surrender all to him. Because just like the song we're about to sing, the God who is our stronghold in a day of trouble is also able to deliver us. So you've heard God's word. You've heard how good the Lord is. You've heard that if you're not one of his, he doesn't know you, but he wants to get to know you by you acknowledging him this morning. The Bible tells us in John 6, 45, it is written in the prophets and they all shall be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that have heard and have learned of the Father, Jesus says, you can come to me. He wants you to come to him. But the way you come to him is by believing in him. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. If we want to be a friend of God, we have to obey his commandments, and that starts with us not doing things our way, but doing things God's way. Because in Luke 13, 3, he calls for us to repent because he says, I tell you, no, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We've already talked in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, but let us hear the words of Jesus again in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, where he says, whosoever shall confess me before men him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. You make an open acknowledgement of him this morning, that he is the Son of God. And when you acknowledge that he is the Son of God, you are acknowledging that the Jesus who died on the cross for our sins is good. He is our stronghold in a day of trouble, and he knows those that belong to him. And we want to, be, we want to belong to Jesus Christ. We want to belong to God. So have your sins washed away. Be made clean, fully whole today by being baptized in water and having your sins forgiven and remitted, thrown into the sea of forgetfulness and remembered no more. Because Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But if you don't believe, you shall be condemned. Once you come up out the waters of baptism, God promises to forgive you of your sins, Acts 2.38. He wants to make you a new creature in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. What kind of creature is that? A creature that can now live his or her life knowing that the Lord is good. Knowing that the Lord is a stronghold in the day of trouble. Knowing that God knows those that have made, that have put their trust in him that have made him their refuge. And the way he makes us, the way he becomes our refuge is by us entering the body of Christ because he adds us to the ultimate stronghold, which is the body of Christ, the church of Christ, the only church that you could read about in scripture. Jesus said he was going to build that church in Matthew 16, 18. He built that church in Acts chapter 2, purchased that church with his very own blood according to Acts chapter 20, verse 28, adds the save to that church according to Acts chapter 2, verse 47, and that church bears his name, Romans 16, 16, salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. But maybe you have already obeyed the gospel. Maybe you are a Christian on this morning. Maybe you've already named the name of Christ. But somewhere along the way, you have forgotten that the Lord is good. Maybe you are in your day of trouble, but you're on the wrong side of the stronghold. This is your opportunity to get back in the fortress of God. Maybe you have forgotten who God is, and therefore God says, I never knew you. But it's time for you to re-requaint re re yourself with God. Get back with him. Let him know 
that you are sorry for whatever it is that you said or have done and God will embrace you just like the father embraced the prodigal son and we may not throw a feast for you but we will celebrate with the angels in heaven that you have made things right with him before it's eternally and everlasting too late. Come back to the Lord while he may be found. Wherever you are this morning, make a wise-hearted decision while together we stand.